Okay. I think we all have words that we like, the pairings of, in particular, fond w words that we um, we want to we want to use. And one of my favourite pairings is tax disc, <laughs> which I've never managed to get into a poem yet. But another of my favourite pairings is inappropriate footwear. Can you hear me properly? Am I going in and out of? Oh, excellent. Um, heels. High over dogs and tricycles at the gate, I carried myself like wine in a wine glass, managing to avoid the usual huddles of mums and dads as instep to instep, left and right, admired their patent leather reflections. Proud and voluptuous still after years in a box at the back of the wardrobe. Nothing I had to celebrate but the shoes themselves could account for such inappropriate footwear. And as I sank into the playground's spongy pink tarmac, even the littlest children knew it. I'm only going to read five poems because I think dinner's on its way. Um, that poem is in the Forward Anthology this year, and the one that I'm going to read now is in the Thorwood Anthology from a few years back. Um, it's modelled on a poem by Thomas Hardy, which he modelled on um, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. So it's a much recycled poem um, and a much recycled poem form. But that's not the real reason why it was in Alice Oswald's anthology um, of climate change poems. Um, and it's not the reason why I adopted the pattern either. So the background, the weather in the background, is really the subject of the poem. Um, it's interesting to me that the events of this poem um, took place in real life after I'd written the poem, and I witnessed them in exactly the same place, um, a stabbing in um, North London on a very, very hot day this year. On Highgate Hill. How it rained. We caught the bus up Highgate Hill, past Whittington's cat and the hospital. The driver insisted he was full, 20 wet children pleading, shrill, how it rained, how it snowed. The bus got stuck on Highgate Hill, and we stood on the pavement in pumps and heels. Children pelted the windows and wheels, their walk to school a wild, white thrill, how it snowed, how it shone. We held our breath down Highgate Hill through stinking heat. A teenage girl chucked study guides across the aisle. A boy spat on Swiss army steel and it shone, how it shone. The children kicked their seats until the driver came roaring up out of his stall. He bent in the middle. We saw it all. The engine turned over. Traffic stood still, how it shone. Before I um, wanted to be a poet, insofar as anyone wants to be a poet, <laughs> before I wanted to be a poet, and before I wanted to be an opera singer, I wanted to be the wife of a farmer. It seemed like a great thing to be. All you did, it seemed to me, at the age of five was bake cakes and pet lambs and raid the hen house for freshly laid eggs. And there was one particular farmer I had in mind. <laughs> he was only 10 years older than my dad and completely fascinating. And this poem is for him. It's called String. The farmer kept his trousers up with string. Out of his pockets, like an entertainer with a punch and judy sausage string, he summoned knots of orange binder twine. A scruffy, scratchy, plastic nest of string, his filthy, freckled hands pressed into mine. The lining of his jacket hung in strings, but there would be a Cadbury's eclair, a humbug, or a coil of licorice string unwinding somewhere hidden in the hem. And I was not to give him back his string until his fingers turned 
into a hen and laid a sweet. He didn't need the string. I tugged his arm and trotted after him. I'd like to um, try a new poem on you um, tonight. World premiere. Um, we're staying in the, um, in the rural um, department. Uh, a lot of my poems have... Um, uh, they, there's, of, there's often a game going on in the poems with, with language, um, surprise, surprise. And the game's often, um, actually often quite an extreme game and it's probably quite obvious. And I think this one, I think you'll probably get it very quickly. Um, um, in case anyone doesn't know, but you're in the publishing industry, so you're bound to, there's a magazine, it's been going for decades, called The Field. It's the magazine of the country gentleman. And my grandparents subscribed to it for many years and never threw away a copy. And um, the front part of that magazine was always full of farms and houses for sale. And if you could read one from like the 1960s, there would be the most beautiful dream houses for sale for very, very small amounts of money. And you would wish you could go back and buy them. Um, so this poem is sort of comes from there. It's called House and Field. When Granny and Grandpa sold the old farmhouse and gave up their subscription to the field, boxes of junk arrived for Dad to house, and soon mildewed editions of the field were stacked in every corner of our house. We should have made a bonfire in the field, or said there was no shelf space in the house for such an archive, decades of the field, whose glossy cow, dog, pheasant, country house Snow-covered moor, frost-furrowed field front photographs put life in our dull house to shame. But for a while, I'd take the field with me to bed, reading romantic house-for-sale particulars as tiny field mice shivered through the walls inside the house and owls protested in the moonlit field. A different life for every different house addressed me from the pages of the field. Bread and roses in a Devon long house, civil war beside a battlefield, a lakeshore lodge with steps down to a boat house or a cottage with a pony field. But I'd have left our three-dimensioned house and time warped over juddering force fields to travel back to Granny and Grandpa's house, its garden open onto barley fields cut into bricks of straw. From their last house, they moved in quick succession to the field behind the church, and Dad cleared out our house. He packed up every copy of the field and left them to the rats in an outhouse that leant a little closer to the field whenever it rained. It was my Wendy house, but now its timbers rot into the field as surely as the walls of Dad's big house shrink to a room that looks across the field. I'm not allowed to help about the house, or mow the thistles flowering in the field. And when his body is an empty house, he wants his ashes scattered in the field, hoping house and field will never be sold. I'm just going to read one more to finish. I'm not very, um, I'm not very, um, keen on poem titles, I quite resent them, I quite object to them, and I can talk to anyone about it afterwards if they want to know why. Um, uh, and I've got two poems in this book which are called Two, and one is T-O and one is T-W-O, this is T-W-O. Um, I love it when you can observe something from the natural world, even if it's in an urban environment, and really think that you're understanding something, about the behaviour of these creatures. Um, and the creatures in this poem are flies, and the space that I witnessed them flying around was very like a page, and they were very like, they were very like a nib of ink uh, inscribing something onto a page. Um, and um, I think that was really what drew, drew my attention to them so much. They were really enjoying what they were doing, too. Into my room, the low-pitched frequency of a fly in December too excited to settle down and be killed just yet. Its blue-black baritone figure of eight, a shoulder-height, attic-shaped song of dimensions, 
spun to the light I went on reading by, or would have, when a second fly, a green bottle quick on its wings, came in five semitones up with the tune from some late night winter fly duet. Over the bed they flew in close disharmony, under and through each other's vibrato, sound in their hair, and the scent in their chemo receptors of something on me that warmed their insect-blooded hearts with insect pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy your starters. Thank you very much, Kate. That was brilliant. Um, you're going to get your starters now as well, I think. I'll turn it off. <laughs>